So what brings you anxiety? For me, I get anxious over, uh, you know, when, when I have too many projects going on, when uh, I get anxious when I have too much responsibility going on in my head. I get anxious when I have conflicts in relationships, when Robin and I maybe have a, a disagreement and I have anxiety over my friends who have conflicts and I just sometimes try to help them and I just are not able to. I get anxious about uh, health when, uh, you know, I have diabetes and so there's fear that comes in. What about this? What about that? And what could be? Uh, and I have anxiety over people who have health issues and I pray for them and I, you know, trying to do all I can, but never seems to be enough. I get anxious about that. I get anxious about, you know, finances when, um, you know, my budget doesn't uh, meet where I think it ought to. And that's pretty common, uh, especially in this season when gas prices have gone up and, and food prices have con gone up. And, and recently this, uh, uh, this summer and fall, I've had a lot of uh, car repairs that needed to be done. And so my budget is just blown. And so the the, the anxiety that I feel is, um, is just, is always going. And uh, today we're looking at the peace of God. And here in, in uh, Philippians chapter four, the peace of God that's available to us. And I want us to think about Jesus when he was on earth. He, he said this to his disciples in John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief has come to steal to kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And what he's saying is, is this life with peace is abundant, is available, but it also is a challenge in the sense that we have a thief, we have an enemy that wants us to keep in this idea of anxiety that we're worried. It's a thief that steals our joy, it steals our peace, uh, he, he's, he divides, so he destroys relationships. And he, uh, he is there always kind of going on as a challenge in our life. And then we have Jesus who is offered an opportunity to live in peace. And so as we look here in Philippians chapter 4, Paul has been writing for three chapters, giving us construction, and now he is moving to some application. Paul always does this in his writings. He moves to applications, which says, um, this is what I want you to know. This is how I want you to live. He says in verse 9, what you have heard or what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, put into practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What you have seen, what you have heard, how you have seen me live my life, both in struggle, in challenge, in imprisonment, in persecution, and now he stands where he's not even sure if he will face execution. But what you have seen and what you have heard in me, put into practice. And Paul has demonstrated a life of peace, a life of joy, um, as we have seen in the book of Philippians, and he's challenging them to do so. In fact, um, he's going to get very practical. He's going to talk about how we ought to live at peace in relationships and how we ought to live at peace internally within ourselves and how to put this into practice. So uh, starting at the beginning of the chapter, cha uh, chapter 4, verse 2, Paul writes, I entreat you, Eurius, and I entreat sentity to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true champ, uh, companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So he, he's probably, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's called out a couple of uh, of women in the church, Yodia and Synthesi, and he is challenging them uh, on, an, on an issue. And these are, are women who have served uh, and labored side by side with Paul, with uh, the church in the gospel, and they have uh, 
when you think about the church at, at Philippi when it started, it actually started when Paul was there and uh, he and Silas and they were, uh, went to the river and there Lydia was and they would pray and uh, she was in, uh, 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 one of the leaders probably in the church. Probably the church met at her house once it got started. A slave girl was, uh, was uh, uh, freed from some uh, bondage. And it, they, as a result, ended up in jail. And the jailer came to faith as Paul was singing and Silas was singing in a, uh, and, and, and the jailer uh, God did a miraculous work in opening the jail and the, and the jailer came to faith. And this is the beginning of the church. So men and women side by side working together uh, have, uh, have functioned. And here these gals are that have, who's also, her, their names are in the book of life. But Paul is now saying, I entreat you, I challenge you, I encourage you, I am pleading with you. And he doesn't name the problem. He doesn't, I don't know um, what that issue was, but Paul knows there is a division and he's been talking about unity and talking about working together, but uh, there's a, a division that's going on. And he says, agree in the Lord, agree in the Lord. And uh, I don't know uh, what, you know, when you think about how do you come to from disagreement to agreement, how do you get there? And, and Paul is, is thinking about the mission and how that um, the, the disunity, as chapter one talked about, how we're working together for the unity of the faith. And this disagreement is causing probably all kinds of problems. When I think about the disagreement and the agreeing in the Lord, no matter what you're facing, there are things that we can agree on. You, might, you may never come to agreement on, uh, on, on, on different aspects of even of the gospel, of, of, uh, of, the, of theology or doctrine, but you can come to agreement on certain things. And I think this is what Paul is saying. Get in agreement on that Jesus is the only way, the only salvation that's available to us, that um, agree that the purpose in which we are living today in the church is for the, the, the gospel to be proclaimed by what we say and how we live. Don't let disagreement and, and disunity get in the way of that. Live in, uh, uh, as gospel partners in unity and live, as it said in, in chapter two, in humility and submission to one another. And so, um, He's challenging them to live in such a way. And I, I, uh, it brings me to think about the church and how, um, how the thief is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And I'm, uh, I think about the, the COVID pandemic that we endured just over the last couple of years. And when that March... Uh, you know, when it really hit in March and the church was challenged to, you know, not meet in auditoriums and, uh, and we had to figure out and, 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 and it was wonderful that we had tools and so that we could continue to keep the church open for going online and all of those kind of things. But we were, um, we had all kinds of division about masks or no masks, vaccines or no vaccines, uh, we were looking, you know, challenges with um, following the guidelines. Is that taking away our rights? Is that what we should do? Should we stand up and rebel? Is the, you know, is the government overreach and all of those kinds of things? And as I think about that, I, and how many friends, how many uh, uh, people were just decided to do different things, and 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 some people left the church, and some people just. Friendships that they had maybe for years all of a sudden became uh, lost. My question is, did we lose focus of our mission while we were finding our own way in um, and maybe more selfish desires, more lesser uh, value than the mission together? Yeah, we can disagree on, on a lot of that stuff, but did we stay on, on focus with we are here as a purpose for the gospel. Jesus is what it's all about. Um, as the world is crashing down around us, let's be an example for Jesus Christ in that time period. And so Paul is saying to um, 
agree in the Lord. And he goes on and said, And I ask you also, true companion, help these women. So I think about Paul saying, I'm not with you. I'm not there. But as a church, come around these gals and work it out. Get them focused through all that they can to get the, the focus back on the mission. And as I, as I read that in, uh, in, in, in that church that Paul's challenging, I, I think of family church. And I just, uh, I, I appreciate so much the love and the care and the interest as partners of the gospel that family church is really about. You know, we have this, this uh, mission statement of people helping people find and follow Jesus. And as I look and see what God is doing among our congregation, I really see people helping people. I see that, um, th- that God is, is, uh, is working when people uh, are seeing the needs around them. They're sharing the gospel. When people are uh, are brokenhearted. I see congregants going around and helping the brokenhearted. And uh, I could, you know, there's so many names and, and stories that come to my mind as we, uh, as I, as I think about that. Uh, recently, there was a, a, somebody I was talking to, and it was a, a ladies group, and there was some conflict that was happening, not necessarily in the group. It was conflict that was happening among a couple of the people that were in the group. Um, and uh, how that they were praying about and bringing these two together that they might, uh, it was very complicated, but they might come to agreement and, uh, and work it out. And, and it was just awesome to hear and how God is at work doing that all the time. And so really the function, uh, the, the, the focus is, is that, that peace in relationships through Living a life in a, as a congregation in unity for the sake of the gospel. Peace in relationship. And it really comes down to gospel partners. Paul says, follow my example. For the sake of the gospel, resolve conflicts that hinder God's eternal work. And I pray that as you uh, are a follower of Jesus and an example of Christ to the world that they will see unity, somebody who is bringing things together and not somebody who is creating conflict. Paul goes on and he talks about this on another level. Verse four, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Let your reasonableness be known be known to everyone. That's kind of an interesting word. In some translations, it's used gentleness. Others, it's moderation. But the idea of of reasonableness is really comes from maybe a foundational word of uh, lenience, which would mean tolerance or gracious. And Paul is now directing this with everyone as... um, uh, As you relate with people, everyone, whether it be people in the church, people outside the church, live a life of reasonableness. Live a life of of tolerance. Live a life of graciousness. And Paul is uh, addressing a church that's under persecution. They're being laughed at. They're being scorned. They're being persecuted for their faith. And Paul says, "As, as partners of the gospel, as as an example and a and our purpose on being on mission for the sake of the gospel, live in reasonableness in a way that people will see Christ in you. And so he is talking about not only gospel partners, but lights in the world. I recently had a, uh, some situations come up with, as I was saying, I had some car challenges and, and, uh, I had a car that, that was low power. It just wasn't functioning correct. Took it into a, uh, to the shop to, for repair. Had some, spent some money on it, got it back, and it just was not operating correctly. So I took it back, and um, they had it in the shop for the morning. And typically, I'd drop it off in the morning, pick it up at noon. And so I hadn't heard from them, but I, I dropped in to pick up my, my car, and uh, I was told that the that there was a major problem that um, they took it out on a test drive and it broke down and they had to get it towed in. And, I go, and as they continued to share, they told me that the engine had ceased. 
Well, you can imagine as I'm sitting at, standing there at the counter what I am feeling, um, the emotions of um, anxiety, of fear, how are we going to pay for this? How, what's this mean? Uh, worry, all these things. And, and, and that kind of comes out in me in anger. <laughs> and it's easy for me to get pretty chippy and, and you know, kind of responding in ways that um, are not gracious. <laughs> and so, um, long story short, I, uh, I'm, I need to get back to Sutherland. So I am... Uh, in the car with the service manager because there wasn't enough employees to, <laughs> to have somebody drive me. So the service manager uh, is taking me uh, to, to Sutherland. And I am, uh, you know, just kind of contemplating all that's going on. And he's having a conversation with me about, well, what do you, so your car's, you know, your engine's blown? And yeah, and, and, I, and I just, you know, I just, there was this challenge inside of me of, of, of this emotion of, of worry and anxious and anger. And the other side was this peace and joy that was un, un, unbelievable. And as I, as I navigated that, um, I, I responded to him by saying, yes, God's got this. And it, it was, I was just in a state of peace. This over here, but, I, but this seemed to be you know, come, rising up in me, a peace and a joy. And I said, God's got this. You know, I'm, uh, I know that... Uh, that he's got, got a plan, he's going to work this out. And, um, and, and as we're driving, you know, we're, we're having this conversation. It's kind of this, this spiritual conversation. And he says, so where, where am I taking you? And I said, oh, um, to family church. And he says, oh, so what do, you, what do you do? I'm a pastor. I was glad that I had <laughs> responded that way. But uh, we had a good conversation, and I believe an opportunity to maybe step into more. But let me tell you what happened um, Earlier that morning, I, I put into practice what we call the blessed rhythm. Begin in prayer. Begin by asking God when you wake up, God, um, I'm here. You're at work in the world. Let me join you today in what you are up to. And per, open up an opportunity. So I, that was my opening prayer. And the next thing on, on bless is, is listen. And so listen to the Spirit if He's prompting you to do something or, or follow what He's doing. Or, and listen to those that are around you that maybe God's going to open up an opportunity to, sh to hear and, and be able to pray for somebody. The next part of the bless strategy is E, eat. Uh, it's a great place to have relationships and people open up around food. And then S stands for serve them. Give them an op uh, look for opportunities to serve, or maybe they can serve you. And then the last one is share. And so I just was this attitude that that prevailed over me in a very challenging situation. That I believe maybe God was honored in my response to a very challenging, disappointing time. So, in relationship, be gospel partners, be lights of the world. That and how we live among the church, as well as lost people. Yeah. Moving on, Paul moves into peace, not only in relationships, but peace inside of you. How do you live at this? And, and going back to this verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. This idea of rejoice, 13 times Paul has brought this up. Here is a guy in prison who's suffering, who is, um, who's not able to just live his life and, and go out and, and, and plant churches like he had. But by his surrendering to God, he was able to have write letters to these churches so we can today have the letter of Philippians. But rejoice, rejoice in spite of the, the, the challenges of, of the persecution that this church is having, rejoice. Well, why can you rejoice? Because the Lord is at hand. And when you look at that, um, that the Lord is at hand, it could be interpreted two ways. Uh, some uh, translations would, would uh, translate that the Lord is near. The Lord is present with me. The Lord is, is um, it, it's talking about location. It's the Lord is, is right here, right now. And what a wonderful thing that, that we can rejoice on, that, that no matter what we go through, no matter what's going on, that the Lord is near. But I believe what, what is, uh, Paul is addressing here is 
not just the nearness of, of, of God in location that he's right here, but that the Lord is at hand, which means that the Lord is coming soon. And in chapter uh, uh, three last week, Jason was, was teaching and we saw the passage where it says that we are citizens of heaven waiting for a savior that the Lord Jesus Christ is someday coming again. And I think Paul is saying, have hope whether he is with us or whether he's coming again, we have hope that whatever we're going through is a short season that has reward and has uh, hope and joy and peace on the other side. Paul goes on and talks about this peace in me in also verse six, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Don't be anxious about anything. Uh, that's a, that is a challenge because as I was saying at the, at the outset, all of these uh, aspects of life between finances, health, relationships, and just overwhelmness. I, it's just a battle every day. And I think about the idea that we become anxious often because we see ourselves as in control. As I'm in control, um, I have everything to be anxious about. When I'm surrendered to God's control and he and I'm walking with him and I'm in the walking in the spirit, then I have this opportunity to live in in uh, in joy and in peace as opposed to anxiety. And I, I like to to think of this uh, my 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 life in, as as a picture frame uh, and and being in the picture. You know, when whenever you uh, see a picture, a group picture that you were taken in you typically are looking for yourself. <laughs> and when I look at and think about this aspect of, of me in the picture, I wake up and live a life where I am the key focus of that picture. And I, it's, it's important for me to come to a place, and it's just, just kind of a mental piece that, that, that's been helpful for me is to put God in the picture frame. I realize that I can live my life if I haven't surrendered to my day, that I'm going to live my life in as the focus of the, of the picture frame. But I need to ask the Father, who is the initiator of salvation and initiator of the, the earth in which we live and the joy that we can have, and Jesus, who was the completer through his death, resurrection, and burial on the cross, and the Holy Spirit, who is the one who is at work in me constantly as I allow him to be. And as I live in that relationship with me and God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the picture frame, I have the opportunity to live in joy and peace. And anxiety can be kind of moved away when I get in the right perspective. There's a uh, a, a quote that I picked up. Most Christians are being crucified on the cross between two thieves. Yesterday, regrets, and tomorrow's worries. It's by Warren Wiersbe, who uh, used to be the pastor at the Moody Church in Chicago, author and, and, and uh, has, has written many commentaries. Uh, but isn't that true? Uh, there, between yesterday's anxieties and today's and tomorrow's and what is that? Uh, it, it's just an ongoing challenge that goes on in our minds. And what Paul is really saying is rejoice in everything and worry about nothing. Well, that's only, that's God's size. I mean, that's, I can't do that when I'm in control. I can't do that unless I am living in step with the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways that we can make this happen is, as it says in the passage, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So let's just break down this idea of prayer. There are three 
aspects. He says, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Often when the, when the writers uh, are, are, are speaking of prayer, that adoration or worship is, uh, is in their minds. And when I think of, of this idea of honoring and lifting up and putting God in his rightful place, I think about as well this idea that um, I often live with major, huge, big problems. And those problems often eclipse my picture and my view of God. Without knowing it, without, uh, with, just on, as, as the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, my problems are often massive. And I find that God in those moments is pretty small. And so this idea of going to prayer and, and lifting God up, I, I'll go and I'll begin to pray uh, through some of the stories of the Old Testament. God took two million people through the Red Sea and, and brought them out of bondage and uh, uh, an army was, was uh, destroyed by that sea. And I, I'll take story after story and, until I have a God who is bigger than my problems and when I am worshiping and, 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 uh, and praising this God who's bigger than my problem, now I'm in the attitude and ready to share my request. But supplication is petitions, requests, requests that are, are needs that I might have and needs that I'm praying for others in. Often we, in prayer, we just run to our needs and, and, and that's what we think of prayer, adoration, pray for our needs, and then lastly, thanksgiving. Thankful for what God has provided and thankful for what he has yet to do as we pray. Praying in faith. And so he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known. And he says then, and the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart's and minds in Christ Jesus. The God of peace will guide your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. God may not change your circumstance, but God will most often change your perspective. We are praying as we pray and ask God to uh, the, the anxiety, the thing that we're concerned about, the thing that we're worried about, the thing that we have really no control over, we, we come before God and say, God, if you will take that away. God, if you, and I think of Jesus, who's probably uh, had some anxiety as even God in the garden, uh, praying to the Father, if there is any way possible, let this cup pass for me. And Jesus, and, and, and Jesus responds, but not your will, mine be done and I, I often think about um, challenges that people have, and I often will say, that's a tough assignment. That's a tough assignment as you walk that walk, whether it be a relational challenge or a health challenge. That's a tough, that's a tough battle. But God is walking with you, and he has an eternal purpose. And as we get our understanding and our, our view of what God might be up to, then we can trust God and believe that maybe there is a purpose that we might see not on earth today, but later in heaven. And he says, And God of peace, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That picture of guard is like, like um, those who are standing around Paul is in, in his imprisonment. They are guards and they're, they're there uh, to make sure that, that things go right. They are there to stand with him. Uh, and we have a God who will stand with us and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus as we walk this battle. So this relational uh, peace in relationships, peace in me as I as, as a as a um, as a as a uh, uh, a person who is a light in the world. And then the last aspect that we want to look at. In uh, verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, 
if there, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is um, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, think on these things. We live in such a negative world and, and the world and all the trouble of it brings great anxiety. And Paul is saying, it's going to take some discipline of your mind. It's going to take some intentionality to focus on what needs to be done. And I would just challenge you, in comparison to all the input that comes into your mind, what percent of your day is your mind focused on God's word? God's word is true. God's word is pure. God's word is just. God's word is lovely. What percent of your life what, and your time and, a, and your waking time is your mind focused on God's word in taking it in, in reading and listening and meditating on it and sharing it with others in reminding yourself of who God is and who, whose you are? What percent? I think so often we are so unindated, we don't realize how little we have in God's word that is at work in us. And Paul is saying, here's a the, here's the practice. If you want to live in peace, be sure to keep a guard on your mind. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, take every thought captive. We have to take captive because we have an enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. I think that... Um, in my journey that it's been important for me to, as I read the scriptures, read it over and over and over. The repetition of reading helps me to remember what God's word is. Paul ends up with this last verse, whatever you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul has demonstrated all the things that he is, we've talked about today. He has lived in joy. He's lived in peace, even amidst some of the greater challenges. And he says, the God of peace will be with you. I don't know if you noticed it, but in, in chapter, uh, or, or in, in verse number seven, it says, and the peace of God, which passes understanding. And here in verse nine, he says, and the God of peace be with you. As we enter into the Christmas season, we hear the songs, we sing the songs, we, we, we understand that when Jesus came, it said, peace came to the world. And what we have come to understand is that the world is anything but peace. Peace is not on the earth. But today, you have an opportunity as a follower of Jesus to live every opportunity to live in peace to live in, in your heart the peace of God that passes understanding. And the God of peace has come to live in you, even though you have a world around you that is negative, that's coming in to, against you, that brings anxiety. We have a choice. I hope today that you will take a step towards living that out in your life. Thank you for listening and God bless you.